American Healthcare Act is. I want to walk you through exactly what this healthcare law is and what we're replacing and how important it is to repeal and replace Obamacare. Not just because the law is collapsing, but because the law is going to get even worse if we do nothing. Let me show you what our problem is and what we're trying to do. We are going to repeal and replace Obamacare, and we're going to do it with a three-pronged approach. Number one is what we're talking about right now. This is what the Ways and Means Committee marked up this morning, what the Commerce Committee is in the middle of right now. That's called reconciliation. That's the American Health Care Act. There are only so many things you can do in that bill because of the Senate floor rules reconciliation. You can't put everything you want in that legislation because if you did, it would be filibustered and you couldn't even bring it up for a vote in the Senate. Number two, administrative action. This law, Obamacare, has 1,442 sections or instances that gives the Secretary of HHS enormous amounts of discretion to administer health care, meaning I don't think Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi, and Harry Reid, when they crammed this bill through, ever thought Donald Trump would be president and Tom Price would be the Secretary of HHS. So number two in our three-pronged approach, administrative action where the Health and Human Services Secretary deregulates the marketplace and allows more choice and more competition to come in the marketplace. Number three, and this is where I think there's a lot of confusion all over the map additional legislation that we feel is important and necessary to give us a truly competitive healthcare marketplace. So think of things like interstate shopping. That's a reform that we long believed in, that we think is really important to get regulatory competition to give people even more choices. Association health plans. Let a farmer buy her insurance through the National Farm Bureau plan or a restaurateur buy his insurance for he and his employees through the National Restaurant Association plan on a nationwide basis. Let small businesses buy their insurance through the NFIB plan nationwide. We would love for that to be in this reconciliation bill, but the rules in the Senate don't allow that to happen. So we're going to move those bills independently. We're going to move those bills at the same time through our process and bring those to the vote. Unfortunately, they'll have to hit what we call the 60-vote threshold. So we have a three-pronged approach, a three-pronged approach to repealing and replacing Obamacare. Let's get into why this needs to happen and why it needs to happen now. Options are disappearing fast. This law is in the middle of a collapse and people are quickly losing their choices. In 2016, the amount of counties in America that had three or more insurers, three or more carriers to choose from, was about 2,000. In 2017, that number has plummeted. Insurers are leaving the marketplace Choice and competition is going away, and people are having less choices. How many insurers, how many counties in America that had just one insurer? A little over 200 just last year. So in America, about 200 counties had only one plan to choose from, one insurer. This year, in 2017, that number has skyrocketed to over 1,000 counties. Over one in three counties in America, you've got one plan to choose from. These insurers probably never intended on being monopolists, but they are in these counties. There is no choice, no competition, one plan to choose from. It's a 454% increase in American counties of people who are stuck with one option. Now that Humana has said that they're going to pull out of the marketplace next year, they're going to be counties that will have zero options. So here is what is happening under a law that is collapsing. Premiums are going up and going up at a very, very fast clip. Options and choices are going down. So what we're seeing in America is people who have to go buy their own health insurance are getting far, far fewer choices down to the point where they have one in, a, in one out of three counties in America, and the price they pay for that coverage is going up and up and up. Take a look at what's going on around the country. This just shows you a map of the premium increases just this year alone. Minnesota. 59% increase in their health insurance premiums. Pennsylvania, 53% increase in their health insurance premiums. Tennessee, 63% increase in their health insurance premiums this year alone, over one year. Alabama, 58%. Oklahoma, 69% increase in their health insurance premiums. Nebraska, 51% increase in their health insurance premiums. Arizona, clocked in, 
at a 116% increase in their health insurance premiums with Obamacare. Here's what's happening. Quote, Obamacare is in a death spiral. It is not getting any better, it's getting worse. That's the CEO of one of America's leading health insurance companies, Aetna, said this just a couple weeks ago. What is a death spiral? It's a weird term, it's kind of gruesome if they ask me. A death spiral is a system where in an insurance pool, only sicker people who absolutely have to have the insurance buy it, and healthier people who want the insurance won't pay those really high prices because it's too expensive and they don't absolutely have to have it because they're healthy. So in any kind of a pool, typically you have a healthy person paying premiums to subsidize that sick person. But the way they set up Obamacare, it's not working that way. So only the people who must have health insurance, the older and sicker person's buying it, it's cranking up the cost of the insurance so fast that the premiums are just spiraling out of control and the insurers are losing so much money that they're just pulling out of the marketplace. That's called a death spiral. It is literally an actuarial or mathematical collapse of the insurance markets. That's what America is facing today. If we simply did nothing, just washed our hands of it, if we in the majority party said, you know what, the Democrats gave us Obamacare, let them live with it, the collateral damage in this country would be awful. More and more people would see even higher premium increases in 2018. More and more people would just see zero choices. We can't do that. The goal of health care reform has always been one we all share. The goal of health care reform is people get access to affordable coverage. Our goal is use choice and competition, not government coercion and mandates. So here is what we propose. Here is the American Health Care Act, the bill that is moving through the committee process through regular order today, the bill that's going to take three weeks just to move through the House because we are following regular order. Lower costs, more choices, not less, patients in control, universal access to care. These are the four driving principles that we are focused on. Lowering the costs, giving people more choices, having patients in control, and universal access to care. Let me walk you through how exactly we propose to do this. These are long-standing conservative principles that those of us who've been working in healthcare for about 20 years have been fighting for, dreaming about, working toward, now we have an opportunity to do that. How do we do this? First of all, you've got to repeal this law. You've got to repeal the taxes in Obamacare, the trillion dollars in taxes on Obamacare that make it harder to make medical devices, that make it harder to lower costs in health insurance, that drive up the cost of health care. The spending. The spending in Obamacare is getting out of control. It's a debt explosion. But more importantly, the way the system works is it's driving up the costs and the mandates. The mandates are arrogant and paternalistic. It is the government at the federal level telling people, this is what you have to buy. It's going to be really expensive. You must do it. If you don't like it, tough. That's what the government is saying to Americans today. So we get rid of the taxes. We get rid of the spending. We get rid of the mandates. The key thing that a lot of people want to know, when I do my listening sessions, when I talk to people with various disease advocacy groups, is they just want to know that when we pass this, the next day they're not going to lose their health insurance. That's not going to happen. We pass this law, and the day after, Americans who have insurance aren't going to lose it the day after. We need to have a stable transition to conservative health care reform, and that's what we're doing so that we do not pull the rug out from anybody who is enjoying some kind of coverage they have today. So we want to have a stable transition. And a, a few of the points that I think are really important to just bring peace in mind to Americans who are concerned about all that's going on here is we want to protect people with pre-existing conditions. We think that that's very important. That has actually been a cornerstone of Republican health care proposals all along. In 2009, I, along with Congressman Devin Nunes, Senator Tom Coburn, Richard Burr, offered the Patient's Choice Act. It was one of our alternatives to Obamacare. Again, like many other Republican alternatives, we had an answer for people with pre-existing conditions, and we have one here. All of our Republican health care alternatives have always agreed with the idea of letting young people stay in their parents' plans until they're 26. We can retain that. What our goal is to do is to provide universal access to quality, affordable health care. Here's another issue with Obamacare. Obamacare is not just the individual market that you think of the Obamacare subsidies. It was also 
a taking over of the Medicaid problem, program. Here's the problem with Medicaid. Medicaid is a program that is Washington controlled and it is done in such a way that it stops innovation and, 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 and experimentation at the state level. It makes it harder for states to customize the Medicaid population and the Medicaid program to work for their particular states. And as a result, more and more doctors just don't take Medicaid. I mean, what good is your coverage if you can't get a doctor? And that is a huge growing problem with Medicaid. Medicaid is also growing at an unsustainable rate, so its ballooning costs are threatening the very viability of the program and our fiscal future. So what we propose is to modernize the Medicaid program. Modernize the Medicaid program along the lines that we as Republicans have been talking about for years. I think it was Ronald Reagan in like the 70s when he was governor who said the states should take over control of Medicaid. Every budget we have had as Republicans. When I was budget chair writing my roadmaps or the path to prosperity, every one of our Republican conservative budgets said, let's get Medicaid control back to the states. In an honor to the principle of federalism, give the states and the governors the freedom and the flexibility to customize the care for their low-income populations how they think needs to occur. Our problems in Wisconsin are a whole lot different than the problems they have in New York or in Nevada or in Utah or California. So we propose more efficient spending, bring the spending on Medicaid to something that is sustainable so it doesn't go bankrupt, and have a safety net for the most vulnerable. Give local control to our states and our governors so that they can craft and customize Medicaid to work for their populations. How do you protect people with pre-existing conditions? I think this is probably one of the most um, important issues of them all. Here is basically what happens today. Under the current system, we have costs driving up. On the current system, options are going away, as I just described. Choices are fleeting, prices are going up, and under the current system, the, the fatal conceit of Obamacare is that we're just gonna make everybody buy our health insurance at the federal government level. Young and healthy people are gonna go into the market and pay for the older, sicker people. So the young, healthy person's gonna be made to buy health care, and they're gonna pay for the person you know, who gets breast cancer in her 40s, or who gets heart disease in his 50s. So take a look at this chart. The red slice here are what I would call people with pre-existing conditions. People who have real health care problems. The blue is the rest of the people in the individual market. That's the market where people don't get health insurance at their jobs, where they buy it themselves. The whole idea of Obamacare is the people on the blue side pay for the people on the red side. The people who are healthy pay for the people who are sick. It's not working and that's why it's in a death spiral. Here's how we propose to tackle this problem. We want to have a system where we encourage states with federal funding to set up risk pools and reinsurance mechanisms. So for example, in Wisconsin, we had a great risk pool that actually worked so that people with real high health care costs and diseases and pre-existing conditions could still get affordable health care. Well, Obamacare repealed that. They had a great risk pool um, reinsurance system in Utah, a good one in Washington State. All those are gone under Obamacare. Here's how they work, and here's how our system would work. We would directly support the people with pre-existing conditions. Let me give you a sense of this. 1% of the people in these markets drive 23% of the cost. 1% of the people in the individual health insurance market drive 23% of the cost. So a reassurance program is to cover more than just the 1% to cover the people who have high health care costs. So by having state innovation funds to go to the states to set up these reinsurance programs, we would directly subsidize the people who have pre-existing conditions. Direct support for the people with pre-existing conditions so that everybody else has cheaper health insurance. What you do when you do this is, the individual market, the people who don't have pre-existing conditions, they have much more stable prices. Let me give you an example. Uh, take a small business that has 40 employees. Let's say that four people in that business get cancer. Well, under that business, that business has to pay for all those cancer patients, all those cancer treatments. So the other 36 people in that 40-person pool had, had get hit with much, much higher premiums to pay for the four that got cancer. That's how insurance works today. And that is one of the reasons why this thing is going bankrupt. Here's our solution. Let's make sure we just cover the people who have pre-existing conditions. Make sure that reinsurance or risk pools kick in for those four people in that small business that get cancer, 
<coughs> subsidize that coverage, and what you do by doing that is you dramatically lower and stabilize the price of insurance for everybody else. So those other 36 people in that small business have predictable prices, lower prices. That brings you more choice, more competition, and lower prices for the vast, vast majority of Americans who are not in the pre-existing condition category. So directly subsidize them through state-based risk and reinsurance pool programs that we would finance with, with support from the federal government to attack this problem and let health insurance stabilize, go down in price. Here's another thing that we think is extremely important. One of the problems we have is we don't really have a consumer dynamic in healthcare. People don't always care what things cost or how good the care is going to be because they don't get that information. We actually immunize or, or block the ability for people to actually see what things cost in healthcare or to act like a consumer. Let me give you an example. Jana and I have three kids. They're 33 months apart. Uh, we call them Irish triplets. <laughs> Our three kids had three tonsillectomies over the course of three years in Janesville, Wisconsin from the same ENT at the same hospital. At each one of these times, I tried to find out, what's this tonsillectomy gonna cost? Never could I get that answer to that question. I only found out what it cost months after those procedures when I got various bills from the ENT, the ear, nose, and throat doctor, from the anesthesiologist, from the hospital, and the variation of price between those three procedures from the same doctor and the same hospital within three years was huge. One of them, the recovery bill, the recovery for my son, he sat in a lazy boy, ate jello, watched SpongeBob for two hours, that was $1,400. I mean, this is stuff is crazy. We don't shop like this for anything else we buy in our life. Why should we shop like this for health care? And so what health savings accounts achieves, this is the law that I helped write in 2003, something that we as conservatives have been fighting for, for the whole time, is we want to increase health savings accounts, which is what we do in this bill, so we have more competition and lower costs. Here's the point I'm trying to make. In 2000, I got LASIK surgery. The reason I can see you all so well is because in 2000, I got this LASIK surgery, which was elective. Insurance didn't cover it. And so I knew exactly what the procedure was gonna cost up front. And since then, this eczema laser that does this procedure has been revolutionized three times, and the price is lower. So in this area of healthcare, quality went up and costs went down because I cared as a consumer what it was. So it's not that that dynamic cannot happen in healthcare, it's that it isn't happening throughout most of healthcare. And what health savings accounts does is it helps hardworking taxpayers get access to affordable solutions to help them pay for their out-of-pocket costs, but it's also their skin in the game, their money. If they save money by saying to a hospital or a doctor or a healthcare provider, what is this gonna cost me? Where's the best value for my money? If we can bring that consumer pressure to bear in healthcare, we can dramatically enlist the support of millions of Americans to help us fix this healthcare problem. And that's one of the critical things we're trying to achieve here. Instead of using OPM, other people's money, to pay for healthcare that you don't care what things cost, we want to harness the power of the marketplace, the power of the consumer, of the patient and the doctor, to demand better services, to demand better quality. We want transparency on price, on quality, and an economic incentive to act on that thing so that we can bring consumers to the bear. This is what we say, this is what we mean when we say we want a patient health care system. Okay, here is a really important part of our American Health Care Act, refundable tax credits. I want to explain exactly what we mean when we say this. Under the current Obamacare system, we have a Washington controlled system with skyrocketing premiums and dwindling choices. It's a death spiral, it's collapsing, government makes you buy what you want to buy, and it's an open-ended subsidy for a lot of Americans. Our solution is a portable monthly tax credit. This is why we believe this is the right way to go. We want a market-based system which will give us lower costs, more competition, and more choices. There's a real problem in the tax code today in that the tax code discriminates against people who don't get health care from their job. If you're working and you're not on Medicaid, and you have a job that's paying you 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour, and that job does not give you health insurance, there's nothing that the tax code does to help you buy health insurance. If you do have health care from your job, you have an open-ended tax benefit. So what we're saying is, that's really kind of not fair to the, to the man or woman who's working at a job that doesn't get health insurance offered to them, 
let's equalize the tax treatment of health care and give people the same kind of tax benefit to go buy health insurance if they don't get it from their job. And giving a person a monthly a, a portable tax credit gives them the ability up front to go buy health insurance of their choosing. And here's the key. You buy what you want to buy. If you don't want to use your tax credit to go buy health insurance, you don't have to. If you don't want to buy this plan, you want to buy that plan, go for it. It's your choice. It's freedom. It's called free market health care. The states get to set up their own health insurance systems. The states get to set up their own regulations so that you can buy whatever you want to buy where you live. That is called patient's choice. That is called a patient-centered system. And that is one of the biggest tools we believe can be used to replace Obamacare. This is part of replacing Obamacare with a system that works to give everybody universal access to affordable coverage. Now, here is where we stand. The current system is riddled with endless regulations that are driving up costs and limiting choices for consumers, and you see how the collapse is occurring. Our solution, greater consumer options. The patient is the nucleus of the healthcare system. We don't want insurance companies becoming monopolies looking for favoritism in a cronyistic way at Washington. We want health insurers, hospitals, doctors, all providers of health care benefits competing against each other for our business as consumers. That is how the great American free enterprise system works in all other aspects of our lives and our economy. That's what should work in this system as well. So the result, you choose the plan that meets your needs. You buy what you want to buy, not what the government tells you to buy. So our goal here is final as this. Lower costs, more choices, patients in control, universal access to care. Um, there are two points I would make in conclusion. We as Republicans have been waiting seven years to do this. We as Republicans who fought the creation of this law and accurately predicted that it would not work ran for office in 2010, in 2012, in 2014, and in 2016 on a promise that we would, if given the ability, we would repeal and replace this law. How many people running for Congress and the Senate did you hear say that? How many times did you hear President Donald Trump, when he was candidate Donald Trump, say that? This is the closest we will ever get to repealing and replacing Obamacare. The time is here, the time is now, this is the moment, and this is the closest this will ever happen. It really comes down to a binary choice. We now have the ability, through the budget rules that we have in the Senate, with our three-pronged approach, to actually make good on our word. We told people in 2016 what it would look like when we had the chance to replace Obamacare. That was our better way plan. That's what this is. So we said in 2016 to our citizens, to the American people, to our constituents, if you give us this chance, this opportunity, this is what we'll do. Now is our chance and our opportunity to do it. Questions? Jack. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You say this is a binary choice. Uh, a two-part question here. Why would somebody not believe this is take it or leave it when you hear from members of the Freedom Caucus and conservatives say take your bill or, or change it? And number two, when the uh, Democrats approved cap and trade in the summer of 2009, there was much criticism of a manager's amendment, which was put in at the end. To, to make that bill right for passage on the floor. When we hear these criticisms from Republicans, why would we expect something like that not to emerge in this case to make that bill okay uh, to pass and get their votes? So I, I would answer it in this way. Uh, what people are talking about, and there's a lot of frustration, a lot of confusion, frankly, out there um, among conservative groups <coughs> and, and even among members, is reconciliation has certain limits. So there are folks who would love to see us put in this reconciliation bill all these other ideas. One conservative group is saying, by golly, you better put uh, shopping across state lines in this bill or we're not going to support it. Guess what, Chad? If we did that, we wouldn't be able to pass this bill. It would be filibustered in the Senate. It wouldn't even come up for a vote. So the last thing we want to do is prevent our ability to actually get law made. So it really is a conversation about the third prong approach. The other bills we're going to pass outside of reconciliation, which in the House, we're a majority body, we can pass, that go to the Senate. So much of the conversations are about moving this other agenda on the same track 
uh, around the same time to get these things done. The, the last point is, as you know the process, but a lot of people don't, we're going to four different committees. That's how legislation works through regular order. We just did the Ways and Means Committee last night. We're in the middle of the Commerce Committee. Next week it goes to the Budget Committee, and then it goes to the Rules Committee before it goes to the House floor. The bill will be out there for three weeks to be looked at. Go to readthebill.gop. It's a 123-page bill. It's not 2,000 pages of something that they just whipped together and flipped to the floor like they did. They didn't, we didn't write it in Harry Reid's office on Christmas Eve. This was written by our committees. And let's back up a second even further. This bill has been worked on for a year. This bill was worked on from January to June last year so that we could offer our constituents and the American people in our Better Way agenda what we would replace Obamacare with. We offered it up in June. We ran on it all through the election, and now we've translated it into legislation. And even backing up further, these two key components, block granting Medicaid back to the states, defederalizing an entitlement, putting a cap on it, that is something that conservatives have been talking about and dreaming about for decades. In repealing another entitlement, Obamacare, its mandates, its subsidies, its taxes, and replacing it with Republican free market health care tax policy? If you told me two, ten years ago this would, that where we would be, I'd, I'd think I'd be in a dream. I'd be doing backflips. To conservatives who've been fighting for health care reform, this is so exciting. And so what's happening now is members realize this is the chance, this is the once in a lifetime opportunity. So naturally in the legislative process, people are saying, well, I'd love to have this in there, I'd love to have that in there. That's the legislative process. That's what we're going through. And what people are sort of learning is this reconciliation tool is pretty tight. There's a lot of stuff we would love to put in the bill, but unfortunately the Senate rules don't allow us to do that. And that's where you see a lot of confusion, a lot of frustration, understandably so. But that's also why we have a three-pronged approach. Administrative actions by Tom Price at HHS and the additional legislation that we're going to move as well. And so just to clarify, not to belabor the point, so you're saying that this bill was crafted in a way that would meet the reconciliation bird test in the Senate. Correct. Ergo, there couldn't be much change to this and you Correct. the other options. Yeah. So, so, so there's not, so not many changes Well, we'll see, bill. we'll see what, what, what we have to do when, when we get our score, because as you know, you don't, when you go to authorizing committees, you typically don't go with your score already. When we get our score, I'm sure we'll probably have to make some tweaks and adjustments. That happens every time we do reconciliation. But yes, this is written, this bill is written so that, it's called privileged. This bill is written so that it can't be filibustered, so that they have to bring it up and vote on it in the Senate. And if we put things in this bill that take that privilege off of it so that it's not reconciliation, they won't even vote on it. They will filibuster it and they won't even vote on it. So that's what I mean when I say, this is the closest we've been to repealing and replacing Obamacare. And let me just say it again, this is the closest we will ever get to repealing and replacing Obamacare. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, how did you come up with the amount that you would give out in tax credits, and why should a family that makes $140,000 a year get the same amount as a family that makes $40,000? It's a really good question. So uh, the amount of the tax credits is based upon um, the way insurance works, and it's modeled after the Tom Price legislation, uh, which he had last year, which is adjust for age and family size. Because the older a person gets, the more costly their health care is. That's how insurance is written. So the tax credit adjusts more tax credit for the person's age. And obviously, if you have a bigger family, you have more health care costs, so a bigger tax credit. Now, why is the cap set where it is? And that's something, by the way, uh, 12 members of the Freedom Caucus, for example, were co-sponsors of the price legislation just last December, which is this kind of a tax credit situation. A lot of our members, through our feedback, we had seven member listening sessions in February, uh, four uh, conferences, getting feedback from our members on this draft of this legislation, getting their ideas, and one of the, the concerns was we should cap this credit, so like a millionaire that doesn't get health care from their work, but as a millionaire doesn't get a tax credit. So that was something that everybody agreed with, and the Ways and Means Committee made that adjustment. But the reason it's set where it is is we don't want to have a job penalty. Go back a few years ago, and when CBO said Obamacare produces job lock, Obamacare says that the equivalent of two to three million people will not go into the workforce, will not take jobs because of the way the Obamacare subsidies work. What I mean when I say that is, if you set that credit limit too low and a person loses their credit, 
by getting a raise or, or, or advancing in life, you don't want to dis, disincentivize that. So they're set at such a level that that wouldn't occur. But they're set at such a level so that it really is for a middle income family or even an upper middle income family so that we never tell a person, don't take that raise, don't get that job, don't take that promotion. We don't want federal tax law or tax credits to ever encourage a person not to advance, not to take a job, not to, to get a raise. That's well, why. Where's the $2,000 figure come from? Let me, let me go in the back. Uh, Kayla Tausche, CNBC. You'll need companies on board to provide the optionality that you're talking about. And almost every industry organization has come out against this. The reason why there isn't as much participation as customers might like is because these companies can't offer these products and still make money. Yeah. How do you get buy-in from a, the business community? It's a great example. Here's what people are not seeing, which is number two. <coughs> uh, Tom Price, for legal reasons, can't tell you what he's thinking about doing. There's, there's, there's laws that prevent that. We can do so much deregulation through the executive branch by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. He actually just put one regulation out the other day, <coughs> which will go a long ways toward lowering the cost of health insurance. So they haven't even seen yet what our Secretary of HHS can do in, in number two, in, in, in phase two here, where they actually can dramatically lower the price of health insurance. So those companies haven't seen that yet. So there are no concessions. You so let me just finish. Day. Let me don't, don't interrupt if you don't mind. Um, here's the other point. We have basically a few options in front of us. Number one, do nothing, let the system collapse. What the insurers are telling us is, if you thought a 25% average premium increase was rough in 2017, it's gonna be a whole lot more of, than that in 2018, and more and more insurers are gonna pull out. So the insurers are telling us, if we don't know what's going on come late spring, we're gonna have massive premium increases and pullouts and you'll collapse the individual market. What they also tell us, though, is if you only repeal the law, just gut and repeal the law, as some folks are suggesting, then you'll have triple-digit premium increases and you'll collapse the individual market. You gotta remember, if we just repeal Obamacare, it's not like life in the world goes back to life before Obamacare. Obamacare did so much damage to the U.S. health insurance system that it's not as if you can just go back to the day before. <coughs> So that's why we are offering a better way. That's why we're offering the American Health Care Act. That's why we're offering a system that brings choice and competition back into the marketplace, gives people to the use of risk pools, health savings accounts, and tax credits the ability to go find affordable coverage, and that brings insurers back into the marketplace. The insurers are telling us that will bring insurers back into the marketplace. If they can actually offer the plans that people want to buy, not the plans that people are making them buy, they'll have more plans being offered. There'll be more choice and more competition. That is what brings down costs. And in conjunction with all the administrative things that Tom Price can do, those efforts together can help dramatically save our system and give us low cost health insurance, better quality health insurance, and access to affordable health insurance. Don't forget how all this works together. Subsidize the sick and the pre-existing condition through risk pools and reinsurance. Health savings accounts to bring the consumer in the marketplace to put pressure on providers to compete for our business based on cost and quality. And then give families who have jobs but don't have the kind of jobs that gives them health insurance benefits the same kind of tax benefit everybody else gets. So they too, at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the month, can go buy a plan that best meets their <coughs> needs. That is how you fix and save the system from the crash that it is, it is occurring. And we're very, very confident that will work that way. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you for uh, putting up with my town hall presentation. I just think it's really important to try and iron out all the differences, to show that there's folks who say, gosh, you should have this and that in this bill. Reconciliation doesn't let you do it. We're doing it here. People who say, well, these regulations are so expensive and so costly, Tom Price at HHS can fix those things. We can fix this problem. We promised the American people we would fix this problem. And the way to fix this problem is to repeal Obamacare and replace it with a patient-centered, market-based system. This is something that we as conservatives have been dreaming